Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Creighton and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. To comply with SB 17, we began with an extensive review of our policies, programs, personnel, and resources. I established a three-member review group consisting of our general counsel, chief compliance officer, and vice chancellor of student affairs to undertake the task. If I'm, uh, if I'm unable to answer any of your questions, Donna Cornell, our general counsel who led this effort is here along with me today, as well as uh, two members of my leadership team, the provost and the vice president for student affairs. This process was a massive undertaking involving many months of work for the group and for our administration, faculty, and staff. I will highlight our findings and actions in the four areas, policies, programs, personnel, and resources. First, our policies. The group reviewed existing policies at the system level and at our four universities and made necessary changes. These changes were minor and primarily involved clarifying intent, scope, and definitions. More significantly, we drafted a new system policy applying to all system campuses addressing the intricacies of SB 17 compliance. It was approved by our board last August. We provided repeated and consistent communications, including FAQ pages to our faculty, staff, and students. These sought to clarify prohibitions and explain exemptions allowed for research, academic programs, and student organization activities. We also conducted multiple in-person informational sessions at each university to follow to allow for better understanding. Along with drafting policies, the review group also examined thousands of university web pages at the system and university levels and made appropriate, uh, appropriate uh, edits. The second category included programming, organized into three broad categories, training, faculty and staff recruitment, and student services. All training modules at the system level and at our universities have been reviewed and revised as necessary to ensure compliance. We eliminated DEI-related training, most of which was delivered by student affairs personnel. We also found some student support programs that were well-intentioned, but nonetheless had exclusionary practices in that their services were limited to only one affinity group. Where appropriate, some programs have been maintained, some eliminated, but are now available. Those that are maintained are now available to all students rather than excluding any of the students. We are formed EEO laws with our HR departments and with academic leaders to further ensure that our faculty and staff recruitment practices are consistent with federal and state laws. Our hiring processes and the required EEO training are fully consistent and are standardized across the UH system. Our EEO training is also approved by the Civil Rights Division of the Texas Workforce Commission. The third category is personnel. Unlike other places, the University of Houston system did not have a system DEI officer, nor did three of the four our, of our universities. UH Clear Lake had a cabinet level position, which has been eliminated. UH Downtown had a director of DEI who resigned in March of 2023. UH Victoria had an associate director of student diversity and inclusion, that position was eliminated in May of 2023, and a new, new position, Director of a Student Life, was created with the new job description and new responsibilities. The University of Houston had two offices in a Student Affairs, Diversity and Inclusion Office, and the LGBTQ Plus Resource Center. These offices have been dissolved. Instead, we created an Office of a Student Advocacy and Community which offers programs focused on its student success and servicing all students. At this point, all DE-related positions have been eliminated and new positions have been created where needed, expressively aimed at student success for all students. System-wide, the review group identified approximately 15 positions that were fully devoted to DEI type of work. 14 of them were in student programming area and none of them, if in existence today, perform DEI functions anymore. 
The review group further identified a very limited number of position, positions where job description included less than half of employees' time directed, directly related to DEI, sometime as little as 5%. Can I continue another minute? Yes. Okay, thank you. These job descriptions and duties were revised to be compliant with the new law. Since the passage of SB 17, a major programmatic shift was implemented, allowing support and wraparound services to be open to all students. Finally, financial resources. The review group identified approximately $750,000 in funding that was devo devoted to DEI system-wide. These resources have been redirected to provide additional student support services to increase graduation rates in particular. I would like to conclude by highlighting that the University of Houston system serves an incredibly diverse student body with diverse faculty and staff. We have been supporting our diverse student body long before DEI became a focus for universities across the country. Our historical efforts have drastically improved graduation rates, reduced time, and decreased the number of credits taken by graduates, eventually resulting in less debt at graduation. For UH, these strategies have been critical in being a top 75 public university and close to being a top 50 public university. We remain committed to our mission of supporting all UH system students in their educational journey and remain dedicated to conducting research that is meaningful to Texans and the state of Texas. We continue to monitor compliance with SB 17, include, including regular audits by our Office of Internal Audit and working with the state auditor to allow for external auditing of our universities. Most importantly, we continue to fund new and collaborative ways to fulfill our mission and support our students. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chancellor. And if you could, for the record, uh, just state your name Sorry. and who you represent. Sorry, I apologize. My name is Renu Kato, Chancellor of the University of Houston System. That's great. Thank you so much. Chancellor Mitchell, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Subcommittee on Higher Education. My name is Ted Mitchell. I'm the, ch uh, the Chancellor of the Texas Tech University System. Uh, thanks for the time uh, for, this, for this opportunity. On May 2nd, I sent a letter to you regarding the progress that our university systems made with respect to implementation of Senate Bill 17. In order to uphold both the letter and the spirit of the law, leadership of the system has worked with leadership at our component institutions to thoroughly address the matter. We've taken comprehensive measures to ensure full compliance with the requirements and provisions set forth in SB 17. While it would be impossible to, in this venue to describe each and every action taken, from a high level, it's included the following. Number one, upon Senate Bill 17 being signed into law by Governor Abbott, our team promptly reviewed the contents to understand its implications. In fact, in anticipation of the bill being signed, our general counsel issued a memorandum to all component institutions the week before to discuss our next steps to ensure compliance. Number two, our system, led by a task force that included the Office of General Counsel, the Office of Equal Opportunity, and the Office of Governmental Relations, developed an, developed an, an implementation plan to review and align all of our policies, operations, trainings, and programs with the requirements set forth in SB 17. Over the next 12 weeks, this task force assisted our component institutions in reviewing all of our, their practices and policies to provide guidance in implementing the bill's requirements. On September 14th of 2023, which is four months prior to the law taking effect, our system issued a general guidance document for all faculty and staff regarding questions related to SB 17. As part of that, we received over 500 inquiries and questions uh, by our component universities. We use these inquiries as a way to advise and develop plans for each of our institutions to fully comply with SB 17. The guidance document developed as a result of this work is available on our system website. Realizing that implementation of SB 17 will require ongoing monitoring, our task force continues to hold a weekly virtual meeting to answer any ongoing questions regarding to ensure compliance. Additionally, our system's Department of Audit Services is currently finishing a system-wide audit as a follow-up to our task force's work. We understand that in order to remain compliant with SB 17, we'll need to continue to monitor the practices of our institutions even after our policies have been put in place. In summary, for our friends on the right, I want to ensure you that our system will not be dividing our students into silos based on race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, etc. We'll comply with both the spirit and the letter of the law as outlined in SB 17. For our friends on the left, I want to ensure you 
that our system's universities will always welcome and support any student who becomes a member of our system family. If they need mental health support, they will get it. If they need academic support, they will get it. If they need social support, they will get it. These young people are under our care, and we will care for them. I believe that the legislation by, by the legislature, by allowing student organizations to continue to form groups related to their identities, did the right thing. Whether students want to align with one another based on their mutual interests in engineering or accounting or chess or the Greek life or based on shared experiences based on race, ethnicity, etc., this allows them a mechanism by which they can pursue common interests and discuss shared life experiences. With that, I'll close and answer any questions. Thank you, Chancellor. Or I'll have, the, I'll have my lawyer answer any questions. Exactly. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> Members, any questions? Senator West. Uh, just a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, thank you for the presentation. Yeah, again, I'm going to ask you the same question. When you put in the, the DEI programs that you have at your, pro, at your component institutions, that were put in to be a part of your strategic plan. And so the question becomes, given that Senate Bill 17 required that you disband those particular programs, how do you make certain that the purpose that they were put in for the first in the first place are still carried out? I believe, Senator, that when you look at the, the metrics that we all follow that are important to us, things like who's applying to your university, uh, who's accepting a place in your universities, uh, who is winding up going there and matriculating to the university, who is keeping their grades up while they're there, who's graduating from your universities. Those are things that are critical to all of us, and you can look at those through the demographics of it and see, are you doing the things you need to do to support every single group that comes through? And if you're not, uh, over the course of a two, three, four, five-year period, it does start showing up. And the, the biennial report will provide sure will. the legislature, yes, the, I guess, the proof of the pudding, so to speak. So our strategic plan at the at universities is consistent with the mission of the universities, which has been to uh, support all the students, increase uh, helping the students um, succeed and finish their educational journey. And vision at, at UH has been to be a top 50 university, which requires the students to be able to graduate on time. So there was a one um, element in the strategic plan, which, uh, which was directly related to DEI that was put on pause so that we can comply with SB 17. But most of the programming that we have that supported in the student's journey those programs continue, however, they are open now to all the students. Now, let me follow up. Uh, here's the follow-up question. As it relates to the DEI programs that you had in place, what types of, um, I guess you could say, uh, activities were they engaged in, other than training? <laughs> So most of the programs were in student uh, services area, student program area. And then there were, um, uh, some of them were DEI office. You said certain student services. Right. Kind of give me an idea what type of student services. There were um, programs uh, that, were, uh, that were catering to, for instance, let's say just the Hispanic women, supporting Hispanic women, or they were in, in engineering, it would be just supporting engineering in women. Those programs have become open to, to everybody. Plus, we were able to now put, put support that we redirected into programs that we very badly needed but didn't have resources to do, and that is for first-generation students, for instance, or programs that require now or that uh, uh, promote more pipeline and support more pipeline programs for us to expose the students. So overall, and then we also started programs which expanded in a Cougar Cupboard program, for instance, because we realized the students needed support in that particular area. We directed some resources toward mental health, not particularly as counselors, because that's a very specific requirement, but we realized that we need to have a program for wellness, physical and mental health wellness. So we put the programs that will support the students in dealing with their anxiety or, or, or And that issues. was a part of the DEI programs? No, the, these programs we put in place. The DEI programs that were there related to, specific to, for instance, Hispanic women or there may be um, urban experience program. Uh, some of these programs were there and then there were many training modules, of course. Okay, what about uh, uh, 
Chancellor Couture is right, most of them were student service related. So if you had something that would be an academic program, academic support for a specific group, you just open it up. It's academic support for any of the students. And so that's basically the way, if you had something that's going to support just a specific group for something, a lot of the, the, the services themselves are the same, but you open it up to anybody that needs that service. So that's, that's you know, the, the students still need service. They still need the support. You just open it up beyond just that specific group to allow it. And that's what you did? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Members, any questions? Uh, Chancellor Mitchell, I was gonna ask you, you know, I, I, we've referred several times to uh, the professor at Tech that had troubles and concerns related to just pledging to treat every student equally, right? And now we're in a, an effort, uh, sort of post passage of DEI. Uh, where uh, I'm sure your institutions are going to continue to audit to make sure there's not a renaming or a relaunching or a reauthorizing of the effort. So, um, you know, that, that specific uh, professor that was in biology, um, he, he was flagged by the department search committee for not uh, being able to articulate the difference between equality and equity. Sure. And also, uh, there was sort of disapproval. He was um, he lost points for using um, what they consider to be improper pronoun usage because he referred to the pronoun he, and then he failed to give a land acknowledgement. And so, not picking on Texas Tech. I mean, these are examples. Sure sounds like it. <laughs> <laughs> these are. I'll, I'll land the plane pretty soon, but the, these uh, examples extend all across Texas, it, it, you know, all across our public institutions, and and certainly weren't, uh, you know, the intention of what originally began is just an effort to increase diverse outcomes in hiring, right? Not excluding all that approached with a sign above HR that said, you know, if you are moderate to conservative, you need not apply here, but. Because that an article referred to that example once again, just in September of 23, uh, it, I'm sure it's part of your auditing process to make sure that faculty hiring and those that are in charge uh, will understand it's a new day. Is that Senator, fair to I, say? Yes, sir. Senator, and it's important not just for that. It's also important because if you look at higher education in general, there's anywhere from an 8 to 14 percent annual attrition rate. So folks that are in all of our universities right now in a year, 8 to 14% of them won't be there. There'll be new folks in there. So one of the things that's important about audit in general with whatever legislation is passed is to make sure that folks that are coming in understand the same thing, not only about uh, the, the law, but policies and procedures and the culture that you're trying to create in your own universities. I think that's a, a great word to use, uh, culture. And I mentioned to the previous panel that it's leadership at the top that has to explain to those that aren't following the legislature, maybe not, maybe haven't read the bill. It's jarring um, to, to many to when they hear that the nomenclature, just the verbiage, diversity, equity, and inclusion units have been removed, right? But when we talk about examples like we just discussed and that uh, all academic institutions in the state in one way or another had fallen into some certain traps with hiring, um, that it's a different day to search for and continue to strive for diverse outcomes while we are also providing a landscape that everyone feels welcome, that there's no chilled free speech, uh, no compelled speech just to get an interview, right? And that there are, um, uh, certainly there's an understanding and an acknowledgement that many of what the national studies from Baylor to Harvard to the University of Tel Aviv that backed up and tried to discredit those studies and found them to be a completely accurate that in the corporate world and in university life, the DEI efforts have taken in us backwards in ways that just have not achieved the uh, hiring effort of minority faculty um, uh, recruitment in, uh, in ways that, uh, that, that show not just progress, but positive numbers they've they've diminished across the state under about under 10 years of looking at the data so um, 
Chancellor Couture, at, at, at uh, U of H downtown, uh, there was a program before the bill that was in the education department that was that type of loyalty-related statement. It was, uh, there were professors, and you're aware of it, that were, that were saying, look, I may not even have an issue with the verbiage, but the, the, just the compelled nature of free speech overall to just maintain good standing right. uh, I, you know there was a, 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 a line drawn related to that because what's next right I mean it, it just kind of depends on whatever's issued at the time based on leadership at the time so do you feel like U of H has an auditing process that will carry us on to January where we review and look back in the review mirror across our institutions where U of H will continue to root out Yes. Uh, as we also redeploy and redefine our efforts going forward. Yes, yeah. we'll be doing audited internal auditing over the summertime. But as for faculty hiring for decades, that's how the hiring has been done. And for us, what has been important is that you do it the hard way, which is you advertise very broadly, you uh, you know communicate uh, throughout the country, and you create as diverse a pool of talent as possible. Because if you don't have diversity in pool, you're not going to ever get the result or an, an, an opportunity given. So we have done it that way. I admit to you that in recent years, some pockets of faculty may have felt overzealous about it, but in general, the faculty do agree that, and they will hire a person who is meritorious. Because to say that we have hired people on the basis of anything but merit would be really an insult to all those you know, faculty of color or different gender that who we have on our uh, staff and, and in our, uh, on our role, they are absolutely excellent. They made it on the basis of merit. Mm -hmm. So I think we have had pockets, but we have had this practice for every search committee before the process of search begins for any faculty position the general counsel comes and, and they have done it throughout this time, explained them what is the discrimination, what is the policy, how you will uh, you know, not discriminate on the basis of anybody. So we have been doing that, but I admit to you, there have been pockets and we have addressed them and we will continue to audit and continue to monitor. And, and to be fair, uh, as a committee, I mean, uh, again, and, and I mentioned it with the first panel, your systems are very large. You've got an incredible number of students and faculty and administrators that, uh, it, is it possible for you and council to catch every email in review, uh, every program, every uh, draft that may not be the final edit, right? Before uh, it, it, it ends up in a professor's hands that's upset, that particular program and that, that sort of loyalty oath or statement that, uh, that is now, in my understanding, that U of H has removed from U of H downtown's English department was that all professors associated with the department are aware that they individually were complicit in systems of oppression through individual and collective actions and that they all embrace equitable strategies and solutions and so again that that particular professor complaining uh, d didn't even admit whether or not he or she agreed with the statement they might very well have but they didn't want it to be compelled and so um, there's a fear and a chilling effect on even those that would apply mm -hmm. to our universities in the future if they think that the label for that particular institution is such and so obviously in academia, we want broad perspectives, diversity of thought, and diversity across, across every category. And thank you for um, uh, restating your commitment and, and that pledge to the auditing process. Uh, that's important to us uh, because uh, you, you have oversight over your own institutions, right? And of course, we have oversight over the higher education landscape at the expectation of Texans. And, and uh, together, uh, I think as we work through the interim and work through this journey, we can, we can get there. So, um, just, 
Uh, yes, Senator West. Just, just one follow up, and I, I agree with you, Chancellor Couture. Uh, you know, uh, we're talking about um, minorities being hired, and all of a sudden uh, they're being painted with this broad brush that they are quote unquote not as effective or competent. Okay, and what uh, members don't realize is that we had this good old boy system too, didn't we? We had the same process that's being quote unquote complained about now was put in place under the good old boy system. And that's, that is just as egregious as in some instances there may have been pockets on university campuses where people were being placed in because of the color of their skin or their gender. The good old boy system put them in based on the color of their race, the color of their skin. So both processes are just as egregious. That's the point I wanted to make. And to be clear, there's no, been no implication that uh, a, uh, a, you know, a minority faculty uh, applicant is assumed in any way to be less than competent, right? I mean, Dr. Ben Carson was our lead witness in Senate Bill 17's hearing, and his testimony leading off for the hearing was that he would not be comfortable thinking he would have a fair shot to be hired as a professor at most universities in, in America because even though he thinks of himself as a competent person, uh, that uh, he just doesn't have the political ideology that would pass muster in order to have a fair shot. And I think that, that that's much more, um, you know, been the sentiment of members in their testimony is everyone needs a fair shot. But I, everyone needs equal opportunity, not necessarily steered political ideology opportunity or uh, equity-based opportunity that, um, that, that suppresses merit and advances, you, you know, other considerations when someone is hired. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I, you know, I agree with you um, in terms of what you just said, but that's not the reality. I mean, the reality is, is that if you have ethnic minorities that are being hired, uh, that there is some, some, sometimes an assumption that they're being hired just because of the color of their skin. That's just, that's just the reality of everyday life. And I know we're trying to get away from that, but we can't, we can't duck reality in terms of what's happening in everyday life. That's my perspective. That's exactly right with those examples uh, that are absolute reality. And then there are also examples, Senator West, where ethnic minorities that are conservatives would not pass the test of a leftist loyalty required political oath to be hired. And we saw that with the A&M Corps of Cadets hiring process that passed on a conservative African-American in lieu of a one-star general with the Obama administration that was Caucasian because the Obama administration Caucasian general committed to a leftist political loyalty oath based on equity and the African-American former Corps cadet was discounted and removed from the applying process because he spoke against DEI. So. It, you know, it's not. It goes, it goes back and forth. Yeah, I mean, it's same not thing, someone's skin color. It's, that, it's, yeah. Well, it's the same thing with the, the dean of the uh, School of Journalism at AM. You remember that? Absolutely. Okay, and, and that was because of her, uh, I don't know that it was because of her skin. I don't think it was. But, but CRT sure. related teaching. CRT. Published, that's right. Exactly. So, that's I mean, it cuts both ways. Yes, sir. Right. It does. Senator Springer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I um, want to go back to a comment y'all made on the students, and, and I appreciate that, that openness. And I think that that was really, I think, one of the things that we were hoping was that any student that thought they needed a service, if it was offered, would be able to get, get that. So I appreciate you doing that. At the same time, uh, Dr. Couture, I'm going to use your example because you, you, know, so you have a program that, let's say, 10 Hispanic females are using. I hope that now there's... 40 or 50, and at least those same 10 are there, and maybe two or three more Hispanic females now feel more comfortable coming as a whole. And we see the growth, but I think we also always need to measure things and, and understand if all of a sudden it becomes two Hispanic females that only go to it now, why did the eight leave? And, and what are we doing to make sure they feel comfortable and do that? Because it's easy for us up here, and, and y'all as well, but we want everybody to feel comfortable to get, whether it's the mental health, 
whether it's the tutoring, whether, whatever that is. And so I just, my, my only uh, comment is, is let's make sure we continue to measure and make sure that, that uh, everybody feels comfortable being there. And, and, and then I'm really happy that we're opening up to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, question for council, um, and I appreciate you being here. <clears throat> I wanted to ask, uh, I wanted to ask uh, each of you, what, what is um, on freedom of information requests? And you, you may know where I'm headed here, but as the public is interested in understanding the different workings of the university, uh, there, there's also work product, right? Yes. And uh, so where is the line, in your opinion, uh, between what the university provides the request or, which is the public documents that that, that particular person would be requesting, and then also um, sort of the intersection where a denial would take place on that request uh, it, based on the category of protected legal work product or simply privileged documents uh, versus, um, you know, those that are recoverable for the public to put their eyes on. What, what, what is your opinion there? I'll take that one. And thank you, Senators. I'm Eric Bentley, Vice Chancellor and General Counsel for the Texas Tech System. Um, you know, the way I'd answer that is that uh, we presume everything to be public, and that's what the law says that we're supposed to do, unless there's an exception. As it relates to the attorney-client privilege um, or attorney work product exception, what we're looking for, if we are giving legal advice to our clients, um, that, is, that is privileged, and we do not want to break that privilege. And so, for example, there were some things early on uh, where we were giving legal advice to, to our clients as to how to comply with SB 17. We wanted those discussions to be free. That's the purpose of having general counsels. You can ask, well, what about this program? What about this? Do we think this is in compliance with the law? So if we have emails and if we have memos uh, going back and forth giving our legal advice, then that, that needs to stay privileged. But uh, there's things that we've done, including, as Chancellor Mitchell said, we've put our, our original memo that, that we had a week before this bill was signed into law. We put that on our website now. Now this is how do you comply with the law? This is what you need to do. And we've put a guidance document up there. And so we're trying to be as transparent as we can be while also protecting the attorney-client privilege. And anything that would embarrass the chancellor. <laughs> That's privilege. Privilege, okay. Not recoverable. Not recoverable. Duly noted. Yeah, so uh, yes, same. Yes, I'm uh, Donna Cornell, uh, the Vice Chancellor, Vice President for Legal Affairs at the University of Houston system. And I hired Eric as a law clerk and he worked for me for a few years, so I'm proud of his answer and I would say something similar to him, to be honest with you. Um, in all seriousness, that, that is true, but in all seriousness, um, you know, we try to be as, I agree, we try to be as open as we possibly can to the public. And we too posted our information on our website to show transparency about how people can understand the new law um, across the system. To the extent we were asking, if somebody was seeking our specific, specific advice on a specific program, asking my legal advice, does that fall within an exception or not? that would be considered privileged. So the the example that I used of U of H downtown and uh, what at that time has since been removed, but at that time would have been considered by some professors to be compelled speech to, to sign off on that political statement before um, all professors there uh, were in some way, shape or form, a, a form oppressive towards uh, you know, underprivileged um, um, individuals in society. If you just simply sent an email from your office as counsel to that English department saying, you may want to make that voluntary, but you don't have to. You've given them legal advice. You represent them. Uh, is that privileged or is that it, recoverable? I, it, it depends on who I'm giving, sending the email to. A good if lawyer I'm, always says the answer is it depends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. No, if I'm sending the, the email to the department chair, then I would consider that privileged because that would be the, the executive uh, arm of that department. If I'm sending it to the entire English department, no, I would not consider that privileged. 
So if there are 16 department chairs and you send simply a CC'd email to 16 department chairs about the same broad category, are all those documents related to public information and the subject at hand not recoverable? I will tell you how I have handled that in the past and how I typically handle it. If I'm sending an email or a directive to all deans, all department chairs, I don't really have an expectation that that is privileged, and so I typically would not put attorney-client privileged on that memo, and I would not, not withhold that information. It's just so broad, but if it's something that it's just to one individual on one specific issue, I would consider that privileged. Is there a situation where the two of you would consult with the chancellor or even with the Board of Regents or um, some other uh, entity or authority uh, before you would make a decision on that? Or is there an appeals process related to your decision? Or the dis are you the final arbiter <laughs> of that decision? <laughs> I'm one of those people that has no authority. <laughs> So um, yes, we would. I would talk about it with my colleagues. If it, if it was an academic issue, I would certainly have a conversation with the provost, with the with the chancellor. Um, if it's a student issue, I'm going to have a conversation with the vice president for student affairs, maybe the dean of students. It just depends on what the situation is. So we, I, I don't like to make decisions in a vacuum. Um, we also involve our uh, chief compliance officer potentially even our chief audit executive. It just depends on the particular situation, but try not to make those decisions in a vacuum. They're not well received when you do things that way, in my experience. One thing I would add to that is that the final decision rests with the Attorney General's office as to whether we can produce, whether we can withhold the information or produce it. And we trust the AG's office. They do a wonderful job in that division. Uh, what, what I would do is, before we're ready to file a brief is, as Donna mentioned, check with you know, the chancellor, check with the board if, if appropriate, check with others to say, okay, we can, I think we can file a brief on this, but I also think we could provide this information if, if, if you wanted to. And so, you know, it's, it's the attorney client privilege is the client's. Um, it's not mine. And so it's, if, if the client ultimately decides, if the chancellor decides, you know what, why don't we just go ahead and produce this document, we will. Uh, but as it relates to trying to withhold it, we'd go to the AG's office and, and uh, they would issue an open records opinion. Is there a fine line between an advisory statement towards a certain department or that department being your client or are they always your client? I, I view them always as my client. I, I view anybody at the university system operating their official capacity as my client. And Chairman, I, one Chancellor. of the things I would say with that is uh, most of the conversations that wind up happening that you wind up trying to make privileged are really conversations that are happening at a high level. Uh, so, for example, if you're going down to a departmental level within a school, very often at that point in time, that individual is, is the one, if they they've done something that is inappropriate or out of line or whatever it may be, the conversation is not about, okay, let me, I'm going to become a personal attorney for this, this individual. It's really more a policy thing that you're having a discussion at a higher level. One of the things that you really have to, to, to keep in mind, I mean, we, we got over a thousand freedom of information requests last year. So the numbers just picked up substantially over time where it becomes uh, it becomes a, a significant burden for the, the legal department in and of itself to the point that we've talked about even hiring additional attorneys just to answer FOIA requests. And I'm not exactly sure why that is, but, but it's become a big deal. Well, I'll, I'll just pick uh, a, 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 you know, an extension of the university just as an example that's not at your level, right? So um, it, it, I'll just choose the basketball team, right? Let's say there was an absolute... Uh, resolute uh, oath that had to be signed by every basketball coach as an applying coach to the team where that coach had to had to commit to equity that every single player plays an equal amount of time on the team so if there was uh, advice sought from counsel to the uh, hiring authority for that coach if it's the head coach or whoever that might be, that wouldn't be at your level, even though you'd probably be privy to 
uh, those exchanges and that advice. And if there was a public information request related to the hiring practices of basketball coaches at Texas Tech or U of H, you know, would the requester be denied or would that always be privileged because they received an email from counsel, you know, six months ago? We had a situation like that. What they'd be requesting would be why that coach got fired. For playing everybody the same? Yeah, yeah I mean, if, if we had something right. like that that was happening that floats up to our level, right? Uh, I'm not worried about a FOIA request on that. I'm worried about why they're doing what they're doing. Because the players that have the most merit play the most, right? Right. Okay, got it, got sure. it. But on the council side of just is that or is that not recoverable, uh, it's just uh, it's interesting to me what that might be because uh, – Obviously, we all have these public information requests. We have them here, you know, in the Senate. Y'all, you, you, you know, probably dedicate a lot of employees and time to exactly that. And uh, But the public deserves uh, sunshine uh, in ways that are transparent instead of it always being it depends. But the spectrum, spectrum always seems to, the pendulum always kind of swings towards, uh, in many categories, privileged. The, we the, agree, and I'm sorry, Donna, go ahead. That's all right. I, I would say that the public has every right to know, like, all of the, everything having to do with the hiring of that particular coach. They would get the rubric that was used to interview, if there was such a thing. They would get the notes of the people that were on the search committee. They would, they should be able to have access to all of those internal documents where the decision was actually being made and on what basis they were making those decisions. I don't have any involvement in hiring coaches, thank goodness. And so me telling a hiring committee, you know, you need to hire the most qualified applicant, I mean, I, I would think that's what you would expect me to say, but my, my memo to the hiring committee like these are the legal standards on which you have to operate under, sure. I would consider privileged. But our hiring rubrics and the like would be public information. And it's not apples to apples, but uh, Senate Bill 17 is, is certainly about, in many aspects, hiring. Sure. And then what the public deserves is sunshine on the processes and what is and is not protected. It's, it's, as a lawyer, it's fascinating to me uh, you know, how that pendulum swings and where we are to make sure the public has the information they need versus, um, you know, the universities, um, you know, also being able to advise their client uh, adequately and, and there to be no disruption or um, uh, diminished nature of effectiveness of that advice. Sammy Senator Kramen, what, yes. what I would say is that... Uh, you know, we don't play games with this. In, in our office, if we, we have email chains, and I've, I've looked through this before, where there might just be one part of that email chain that's privileged, and that's the part that we ask the AG's office for us to redact, and we'll produce the, entire, the rest of it. So we don't play games trying to say, okay, just because I sent one email makes, you know, everything that they've ever done privileged, it doesn't. So, right. And the AG's office doesn't rule in that way. They, they, they hold us to that standard of making sure we prove everything. I want to make it clear to uh, our members and uh, our audience and those watching, uh, we have different sets of questions for different institutions that apply to all institutions. We just are not applying those uh, uh, various questions to just one institution because that would inundate the hearing where uh, Texas A&M answered all of our questions and then the rest of our witnesses, uh, you know, we were finished with the content. So. We're spreading this, this uh, content out. Um, we have world-class universities at the table right now, and I hope that that's clear to everyone watching and listening. These aren't directed at Texas Tech or U of H, right? So, Senator Menendez. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, uh, you just stated something that got my attention. You talked about hiring processes. Yeah. And I think, Dr. Couture, you, you, you touched on it as well. In order to have a diverse staff made up of the people who deserve the, mo the, the seats be based on their, their capabilities, you've, you've asked to do plenty of outreach, do more outreach, go find people. One of the concerns for me is that 
the DEI was a were tools to help you achieve diversity, equity, and inclusion. But I think if I heard you correctly, you can still achieve a diverse staff, a diverse student body. You just have to go out and do more outreach, I think is what I heard you say, is that? Yeah, th there are just um, harder ways and uh, we just don't want to be complacent about this. Right. And sometimes that's what was happening. So for example, with the faculty hiring, there are many th tools that we have been using and institutions have been using to attract a diverse pool. Among them is, of course, you have to advertise broadly mm -hmm. and reach out in different publications, use your many channels like American Council of Ed Education has the program, mentoring program for preparing people for executive positions or, or so on. You call your friends, but then also there are candidates and professors at other institutions, you invite them to your institution for lecture or something so they can be exposed to what mm -hmm. you have on your campus because sometimes people don't know. Right. All of those things we were using even before DEI became DEI. And faculty also very much like and, and encourage those. As, of, as I was saying, it's just the pockets that were just started using something different. So mm -hmm. we continue to do that because we know at our institution, I mean, I'll use the example of University of Houston. 70% of our students are from underserved or minority uh, categories. Whatever program we do, if our goal is to increase graduation rate, we just can't really be targeting anyway. We, and whatever we do, we, we just need to think about helping everybody. Right. And same thing for faculty staff. We wanna make sure there are role models also available but what people like to see is, is there a support system at the university? Will I have people who look like me? Mm -hmm. And so when they come and visit the campus, they see the diversity of Houston, they see the diversity of student body and other colleagues, I think they get encouraged then to apply. So those are the kinds of things we like to use. So you said they see the diversity of Houston, the most diverse, one of the most diverse cities in the nation. They see the diversity of the campus they see people who look like me and they feel welcome, they feel at home, right? Is that what I heard you say? They feel comfortable, they feel welcome. Yeah. And, and, that, and I think that what I, what I am going to miss about DEI is that that was what they were trying to achieve at all universities because not all universities are placed in places like Houston and that you were blessed to have the diversity. And I think that diverse students deserve that, that ability to feel welcome at home in places like Lubbock and places like North Texas and places like a College Station. They should feel welcome anywhere. So thank you for your efforts. But I, I think you've kind of highlighted why I think we still need uh, services like DEI. But I'm glad to see that you take the money and you expanded it to all students because it's, it's, the, the services to the students are still needed. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members, any other questions? Uh, I, I, uh, before we wrap up, I, I asked the previous panel from A&M and from uh, the UT system, obviously in light of all the campus unrest uh, that we've seen over the past couple of weeks across the country, we saw uh, most of that activity uh, of concern was on the campus of UT Austin. Just wanted to give each of you uh, uh, an opportunity to comment on that uh, in, uh, in, in obviously with the understanding that protecting uh, free speech and, and the rights tied to the First Amendment is paramount, right? But also safety, uh, you know, everyone's safety uh, it is uh, of great concern and is a check and a limitation on free speech when some students don't feel safe. So. Could you just give us your perspective on, on that sure. for, the, for the record? Mr. Chairman, sitting out in front of Texas Tech University is a statue of the great American humorist Will Rogers. One of my favorite quotes from Will Rogers is, liberty doesn't work as well in practice as it does in speeches. And it's the truth that we've found. It's hard. He also it's, said there's no greater threat to life, liberty, and property than when the legislature's in session. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring that one up. No, but, but no, but the <laughs> fact is it's hard. It really is hard. We have had multiple <laughs> meetings with students 
during a time that's very turbulent and, uh, and, and working very, very closely with student organizations. The First Amendment is exquisitely important. How we comport ourselves with one another is also exquisitely important. And finding that balance all the time is, in my opinion, part of what we should be trying to do in higher education. Uh, there's a guy named James Truslow Adams that wrote a book in 1931 called The Epic of America. This is a guy that coined the phrase the American dream. He was a higher educator. He said, in his opinion, there were two educations that we were responsible for. One was teaching people how to make a living. The second education was teaching people how to live. I think in the United States, we've done a great job at teaching people how to make a living. In some ways, I think we've done not quite as good a job in teaching them how to live, how to have conversations with people that you disagree with in a way that is respectful, uh, how to be able to voice your opinion without stomping out somebody else's opinion. And I think that one of the things that the way that in higher education that we need to do a better job of is helping our students learn how to communicate better with one another, how to express themselves in ways where their right their First Amendment right is protected while the way they engage with their fellow citizens is also respectful. I think that that's well said. I just want to, 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 to want to add, I mean, there, there's no place on the Texas Tech University campus or system for anti-Semitism or Jewish students feeling unsafe, correct? Absolutely not. And to quote my general counsel, the First Amendment uh, does not uh, excuse criminal activity. Go ahead. Thank so, you, Chancellor. Uh, I agree. Of course, everything Chancellor said, we truly uh, do believe also in uh, freedom of expression, free freedom of speech, First Amendment rights. We have had at least 10 days, we have had um, protests um, uh, from students ranging anywhere from 20 to 200. Um, our staff has been frequently meeting with the students on both sides, um, just wanting to make sure they understand that they have the rights, but that they, they have to honor the, within the, the policies that they cannot do X, Y, and Z, which includes the same thing, which is safety, or they, uh, they cannot um, cross the boundary where the campus becomes unsafe or where the core mission of uh, the university, which is learning environment, uh, becomes dysfunctional. We have a great law center. I have called upon on faculty also to take their advice and their interpretation. And if there was fine line, yes, it's very hard. But I would say our students have been protesting. They're, they're, they're loud, they're passionate, they believe in a cause, and I think they have that right to free speech, but they have done it peacefully and uh, they have honored um, the, 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 the rules, and uh, so, so far, uh, it's been good. For, for, it's my understanding law enforcement did help or assist in removing yes. an encampment uh, yes. uh, at the end of the day. Was that because hours expired or that they had just be, moved no. beyond the university's rules? What was the decision there? On, it was actually uh, first thing in the morning. Senator. Got it. They, yeah, encampment began, uh, as, according to the report, at 7 a.m., and uh, there were warnings given three times, and because encampment is not allowed on state property, right. and then at 9 o'clock, uh, UH police uh, removed the encampment. And I, I think that's the difference uh, in Texas examples as opposed to what happened at Columbia or Harvard or UCLA or Occidental or I mean many of these you know UNC um, many of these different examples around the country uh, is that there's a mis there's a misconception among the those many of those that organized a protest and called upon their comrades all over the country to emulate in Texas on campus what was happening at Columbia that was the exact rhetoric right there's a misconception that you can commandeer public property on a campus, a publicly funded university campus, and disrupt finals week, disrupt the flow of foot traffic, just individual students feeling comfortable walking back and forth to finals or to enter the library or a certain academic building and building an absolute barricaded encampment. That, that That's beyond the First Amendment, right? And so, 
uh, violation of rules and breaking the law, as Chancellor Mitchell uh, uh, used in his rhetoric, uh, that is where tripwires happened that went beyond what a lot of the protesters that were, uh, you know, organizing on these campuses with students meant. As we heard, uh, you know, sometimes up to half of them were not students, right? But we have uh, information uh, th that is very accurate showing that from the October 7th attack by Hamas on, on Israeli citizens, that these organizers from around the country were on our campuses with student organizations uh, just days after that, working on exactly this, which is why the issue at Columbia University was a time frame of months, not just the last 14 days when all the news was covering it. So uh, with that, uh, members, any other questions, any other uh, comments? Uh, thank you uh, to each of you for your uh, very helpful you. testimony for thank the hearing.